So I know you're all here because you want to have better brains. Anybody here not want to have a better brain? How do you have a better brain? Is it by tricks and tools and techniques? Well, yeah, those are incredibly helpful and Jim is the expert at that. But I want to share with you a different idea, which is that your biology affects your brain, that your body affects your brain. And that if you don't realize that, then you're going to miss a huge opportunity to create a powerful brain. Who wants a powerful brain here? Who, who doesn't feel like their brain is as powerful as they like and are more distracted, more depressed, more tired, have more brain fog or more memory issues than they like? Anybody? A lot of you, right? It's very common. So what we're going to focus on today is how do you use the science of what we call systems or functional medicine? How do we use the future thinking that's going to transform our healthcare system to power up your brains in a way that are hard to even imagine. And if I stood here and I told you the future of healthcare and the future of medicine is going to allow us to reverse depression, to reverse dementia, to even cure autism or ADD, you'd probably look at me and think I was nuts. But I'm going to share with you stories today of real patients that I've treated over the years who have reversed these problems. Because we now know how to do this. It's not happening in the hospital, it's not happening in most clinics, it's not happening in the doctor's office. But the science of the future of healthcare is here, and I want to share with you what that is. It's really about understanding how to reduce, I don't know if, um, excuse me, the, the, the monitor here isn't working, so I can turn that on, that'd be great. So, you know, we, we spend a lot of, of money on, on healthcare, and, and the, the amount of money we spend over the next 20 years is going to be $47 trillion globally to deal with chronic disease. These are lifestyle preventable chronic illnesses that are going to bankrupt our global economy. There's nothing else that's as important as this in transforming what's going on. It's as much as the GDP of the six largest economies combined. Two trillion dollars. And, and there's more money, by the way, that costs companies and our society in lost productivity than actually on direct health care costs. People being at the job but not being on the job. And those of you who own companies or who work with people want to have people who are engaged and present and focused. And ma many people are just working at the job but not on the job. So the, uh, the whole idea is how do you increase the, the uh, ROI by reducing the BOI, which is the burden of illness? And how do you do that also through the return on community, as Tony and his group are talking about? How do you think about changing the way we think about disease? So also, how do we measure success, right? What are the metrics we use for success? In, in business, in life, you know, in, in, I just came back from the World Economic Forum where they talked about GDP and measurements of success, but they were starting to reframe it and talking about what is the way we measure success? Is it, is it human capital? Is it nature's capital? How do we create, you know, happiness and joy? I just came back from Bhutan where there was a gross national happiness measurement, a set of metrics to measure the happiness of the population. When we look at the earth, how are the things that we do every day impacting the planet we live on, impacting our communities, impacting the life that we have. So what I want to do now is, is sort of explain to you a very simple idea, which is that your brain is the hardware, but it has an operating system. And that operating system for most of us is not functioning very well. It has a lot of bugs. What I'm going to teach you is the science of how to optimize the operating system to upgrade your biological software that runs your hardware better. Because if you want a good brain and all the things that come with it, which is the capacity to learn and love and connect and be alive, you need to understand how to optimize your brain function and, and improve that biological software. And the promise of this thinking is what we call personalized medicine or functional medicine or medicine 2.0 or P4 medicine. There's a lot of names for it. It's all the same thing. It's really the science of thinking about the body as a dynamic, interconnected system. That if we deal with the root cause of disease, that we can transform our health. We have, we have a model of functional medicine, which is medicine by cause, not by symptom. Right? Most of the way we think about disease today is based on the silos that we learned in medical school. You have a cardiologist and a neurologist and a rheumatologist and a gastroenterologist. You have a, a doctor for every inch of your body, but they don't connect the dots. So if you go to the doctor and you have a headache and a rash and your joints hurt, you have some memory issues, you're depressed, they're going to say, wait, 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 I can deal with one problem today. Let me send you to four or five different specialists uh, and, and then they'll treat you and figure out what's wrong. The problem is everything's connected. The body is an interconnected web-like system. 
And that's what functional medicine is. It's the science of understanding those connections and those patterns that are in the story of our life. And, and what I'm going to do today is take you on a very deep dive into a few patient stories as a way of illustrating this model. And some of it's quite scientific, but the basic concept here is that we have the science to understand how to upgrade your biological software in your brain. And we have a very few simple ideas that are affecting this. One is that your body requires certain ingredients to be healthy. Very simple idea. And there are certain things that are impediments to health. So if we identify what those impediments to health are, and we remove those, we take away the bad stuff, and we identify what those ingredients are for creating health, and we provide those, it's like, how do you create a healthy garden? How do you create a healthy soil? We know what those things are. And you provide those things. You take out the bad stuff, you put in the good stuff. The body has an extraordinary capacity to heal. And you don't need to treat diseases individually. You know, medicine is really all about treating diseases and naming, we call it the naming and blaming game. I call it the name it, blame it, and tame it game. We have, we have let's say, for example, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis. Well, we say that's the cause of your pain in your joints. That's not the cause, it's just this sort of the name that we give to people who have those symptoms. The cause may be many different things, as, as we'll show you. So we have to think about the root causes, and when you get to the root of the problem, you don't actually have to treat the symptoms. The symptoms go away as a side effect of creating health. In fact, disease goes away as a side effect of creating health. Most of us in medical school never learned about how to create health. It wasn't, you know, health 101. We learned about heart disease 101 and, you know, brain dementia 101 and, and, and reflux 101. But we didn't learn about how to really create health. And that's the science of, of systems or functional medicine. How are you guys doing? What? Okay. So, so when, we, when we, re we think this whole model, it gives us an opportunity to understand the root causes. So what, when I see a patient, what I do is I, I look very differently at their story. I see the same details, but I look very differently at their story. I want to know what are the predisposing factors that led them to this problem. We're learning, for example, about the microbiome, which is this incredible organism that lives inside of you that's the sum total of all the bacteria that are in your gut and in you and on you. There are 10 times as many bacterial cells in you and on you than your old cells. There's 100 times more bacterial DNA in you than your own DNA. You're only 10% human. And those microbes play a huge role in your health. And we're always taught to you know, be afraid of germs. Well, we need our germs. Our germs are us. And Michael Pollan wrote a great article in the New York Times this last weekend talking about the human microbiome and how it interacts with our health and how, for example, indigenous cultures have very different microbes than people who are eating a Western processed diet and how that is triggering obesity and how that's triggering heart disease and diabetes and mood disorders, how it's triggering autoimmune diseases and allergy and other problems. So how do we begin to understand the body as this interconnected web-like system? Where we're in fact learning that it's not only the microbiome that you're eating, but it's the plant genome that you're eating it's interacting with your genome, with the bacterial genome, with your own genome, and you've got the genomes of plants and microbes and humans all interacting with every bite of food you take. We live in a dynamic system that's our human body, and if we don't understand how to play with that, how to engage that, how to transform that through connecting the dots and seeing how all these pieces fit together, we're missing the boat and really the opportunity we have not just to reverse mood disorders and brain disorders, and by the way, there's one point one billion people in the world suffering with some sort of mood or brain problem. There's a problem of, of dementia, of depression, of Alzheimer's, of, of ADD, autism. These are powerful problems. Let's get through a few of these. We talked about it. So uh, and it's important to think about how we prevent these problems. Because if you just wait too late, if you've already had brain atrophy, and you've already had dementia start in, it's very hard. I had a patient here. Mr. HS, who had declining mental function, and it was just really too late for this guy to kind of do anything about it. So it's very important to start early. Now, if your brain's not working well, the question is why not? Is it a deficiency of Prozac or an Alzheimer's drug or an ADD drug? I mean, we're now seeing 14% of kids with ADD. One in 10 kids are in an in, in, in ADD medication. Uh, recent data showed that we're seeing an increase in just, in just five years from 36 million people in the world to 150 million people with dementia with a cost of over half a trillion dollars a year. 
right? So how do we how do we work with the brain differently? How do we understand why these labels that we have for diseases don't really matter? How we can use this new model of systems thinking or functional medicine to actually change our brain and change our health? How does your brain actually work? What hurts it? What helps it? How do you optimize your brain function and your mood and your focus and your performance? These are very simple questions, but they have profound implications for our society. We're seeing now an achievement gap in our society where children are not learning well. We're seeing, I spoke to General Jack P. he said 70% of applicants for the military are either too fat or, or not uh, performing well enough on tests to actually enter the military. So we need a different prescription for creating a powerful brain. I wrote about this in my book a few years ago, The Ultra Mind Solution, which I encourage you to have a look at because it really maps out specifically how to do this for yourself. It's really a self-care map for optimizing your brain function. And the basic idea here is if you change your body, you change your brain. You can meditate and you can do brain exercises all you want, but if you have B12 deficiency or your thyroid's not working or you're full of heavy metals or you've got strange microbes in your gut, it's going to be very hard to be enlightened unless you fix these things. It's going to be very hard to learn and have your memory work unless you fix these things. And these diseases that we focus on, that are they're really the, 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 they're the external sort of signs of a problem, don't really matter. The, the labels that we give diseases don't really matter. If you call it autism or Alzheimer's or depression, they're all the same disease with the same root causes that show up differently in different people. So the hypothesis here is there's no such thing as depression or bipolar disease or autism or ADD or dementia. But these are just constructs and ideas that we give to groups of people who have the same symptoms. But it's got to be a much different way of thinking than that. That these are really systemic disorders. That these are whole system disorders that we need to treat and not just do the name it, blame it, and tame it game. Name the disease, blame the name for the problem, and then tame it with a drug. We have this whole categorization system for mental illness called the DSM-IV, which, which the head of the Institute for Mental Health at the NIH said it has 100% accuracy but 0% validity. Meaning it's very good at describing groups of people who share those symptoms, but it's not valid in describing the underlying cause. It's, not, it's medicine by symptom, not by cause. This is a great article in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, which I call my favorite alternative medical journal. Because there's always stuff in there that's talking about the future of healthcare. This is an article that said the concept of dementia is obsolete, and you could substitute any word in there. The concept of diabetes or heart disease or cancer is obsolete. It combines categorical misclassification with etiologic imprecision. That means we categorize by symptoms, not by etiology or cause. We're very imprecise. So we're going to shift to medicine by cause, and I'm going to take you down into a few stories that are going to illustrate how to apply this in real patients. These patients have serious problems, and many of you may not have problems as serious, but the same principles apply to go from average function to optimal performance and full engagement. So if a patient comes to see me and they have hopelessness and sad mood and they're not interested in sex and they don't want to eat and they can't sleep well and they feel like killing themselves, then most of you say, oh, I know what's wrong with them. They have depression and they need an antidepressant. But depression is just the name of those set of symptoms. It's not the cause. So, for example, it could be caused by the fact that they, we've changed the, the hybridization of wheat and it has higher levels of a protein called gluten that are inflammatory. And those inflammatory proteins can create autoimmune disease. And that autoimmune disease can affect your thyroid. And a low thyroid function can cause depression. Or maybe it's because you had reflux because you're eating too many sausages and, and, and processed food. And you have reflux and your doctor gave you an acid blocking drug for 10 years. And you become B12 deficient because that drug blocks B12 absorption. And that causes depression. Or maybe it's because you don't live in Nevada, but you live in Seattle and you have vitamin D deficiency. Or maybe it's because you've taken antibiotics and altered the gut flora, which changed the way peptides and neurotransmitters are produced in your gut that affect your brain. Or maybe it's because you love sushi and you have mercury poisoning. Or maybe it's because you hate fish and have omega-3 deficiency. Or maybe it's because you love sugar and have prediabetes, which causes depression. Every single one of those things causes depression. And the treatment for each one is different. So you can have one disease with many causes. So depression is not a Prozac deficiency, right? It's something else. It's something else. And, and doctors here in this country have gotten hooked into the pharma industry. The number one, two selling class of drugs are statins and, 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 and psychoactive drugs, right? 
But here, you know, 113,000 doctors from coast to coast recommend Camels more than any other cigarettes, right? We have more doctors recommend Prozac or Lipitor. You can just substitute those words. And this is all going by the wayside. As Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Right? <laughs> so we have such a fixed idea of disease. If I said to you that diseases don't exist, if I said to the doctors in this, in this country that diseases don't really exist, they're going to think I'm crazy. So we have to redefine disease from these silos to systems. We have to rethink the way we name diseases. We have to see the body as a network. It's really network medicine or systems medicine. In the same way that one disease can have many causes, one factor, one causative factor, can create many diseases, as we'll see in these patients. So for example, gluten, which you might have heard about, can trigger many illnesses. It can cause depression, it can cause autism, it can cause rheumatoid arthritis, or osteoporosis, or irritable bowel, or inflammatory bowel, or heart disease, or cancer, or dementia. All from eating this protein that creates inflammation in the body. Very different model here. We're talking about one factor that creates many, many illnesses. So we have a huge burden of disease in this country, and we're not solving it. We're spending more and more and getting less and less. We spend more than twice as any, any nation on health care costs and per person per capita health care, and we're way down in life expectancy and mortality and so many other metrics of health care. The Institute of Medicine just came out with a report saying how horrible our health status is as a nation, despite the fact that we spend so much money. We're seeing increases in obesity, and diabetes, and heart disease, and cancer, and autoimmune diseases, and depression, and mood disorders, and aut I mean, it's, it's frightening, and we're, we're just doing the same thing over and over and getting the same outcome and wondering why we're not changing things. So if you're suffering from brain damage, let's go talk about why you have brain damage. First is, uh, you know, your brain is very susceptible to insults. It's a very sensitive organ. And whatever's happening in your body is happening in your brain. It's not disconnected. You know, most psychiatrists think, you know, your brain is sort of up here and everything that happens up here is separate from what happens in the rest of your body. Your body is a powerful integrated system and your brain is part of that. And if you don't understand how to work with that, you're missing an opportunity to optimize your brain. So we can actually recreate new brain cells at any moment in life. They did markers of cancer patients where they looked at regenerating brain cells and they actually found that even up to the moment of death, you're creating new brain cells. We are found that you can actually increase connections between brain cells, simply by things like exercise or, or things that reduce insulin that are called uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factors. It's like miracle growth for your brain. So we can create new brain cells, we can increase connections, and we can do that through, through all sorts of different tools and strategies. So if you have this, this problem of a broken brain, which I call is this sort of collective problem we have, what causes it? Well, chemical imbalances. Maybe you'll have some genetic problems or receptor issues, and the people are more susceptible to having problems. It, it's not a drug deficiency. It's not a Prozac deficiency or Alzheimer's drug deficiency or ADD drug deficiency. These are, these are just band-aids. The causes primarily are industrial processed, hyperpalatable, uh, sugar, salt, fat, chemical diet. It's toxins in the environment, petrochemical toxins, heavy metal toxins. It's chronic stress. It's inflammatory triggers like microbes and allergens. These are the true causes. In toxic foods, we eat a huge amount of what I call anti-nutrients. Sugar, high fructose corn syrup, trans fats, uh, additives, artificial sweeteners. You know, MSG triples your insulin production. It's in everything. You know, I went down to South Carolina and worked with this family to help them learn how to cook as part of a movie called Fed Up that I'm doing with Katie Kirk and Lori David. And I went into their kitchen and we took everything out of the cupboards and put it on the table and we read the labels. And if you covered the front of the box, you couldn't tell if it was a pizza stuffer or a Pop-Tart. It had the same ingredients. Flour and sugar, high fructose corn syrup, trans fats, MSG. And MSG drives obesity and overeating. There's also other things in there, pesticides, hormones, GMO. And we do many things that affect our brain. How much we sleep or don't. How much stress we're under whether we sit or move, and whether we're sedentary. And trauma, physical trauma, like, like Jim said, he hit his head, that can have an effect on the brain. Toxic <coughs> drugs we use all the time. Nicotine, caffeine, alcohol, all these are drugs that affect our brain function. Uh, medications, huge impact. Statins are causing neurologic dysfunction. Acid blockers block your B12 absorption. Tylenol affects your ability to detoxify. Vaccines contain mercury. Seizure medications deplete folate. And there's a huge amount of drug-nutrient interactions. Chemicals, metals, and even toxic waves like EMFs all affect our brain. So depression, ADD, autism, dementia, these aren't diseases, they're just symptoms. And then what are the causes? So this is the new framework of functional medicine. We talk about 
inflammation, we talk about nutrient status, we talk about hormonal balance, digestive function. These are the fundamental new nodes in our biological network. So the things that I'm interested in are what, what's going on underneath the hood? What are the ways that we can optimize our biological software? It's by improving B vitamin status, we call methylation. I'll talk to you about that more in a minute. Uh, B12, B6, and folate. Vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, omega-3 fats. You're finding out that vets are the lowest in omega-3 of any population in this country, which is already pretty low. And that's why they're susceptible to PTSD or to uh, depression when they come back from the war because they're already so low in this basic substrate of your brain. 60% of your brain is made up of omega-3 fats. You're all fatheads, basically. And if you don't have the right fat in there, you're in trouble. Inflammation, anything that triggers inflammation affects your brain. And we're learning that dementia is an inflammatory disease, that ADD, that autism, that even depression is an inflammatory disease. In fact, they're using anti-inflammatory drugs to actually treat depression in some cases. But it can be triggered by other things that we know are causing depression. Food sensitivities, gluten, microbes, toxins, sugar, mold, all these things affect the brain. Hormones, thyroid, adrenal, sex hormones, insulin, blood sugar. My last book was on diabetes and blood sugar. It's all about how the brain is affected by these hormones. Gut, we just talked about the gut microbiome. Huge effect. I, I had a girl once who had, uh, she was six years old, she was violent. She was this cute little six-year-old girl who, who was abusing her sister and was getting you know, kicked out of class 10 times a day and barely could make it home on the bus without the bus driver wanting to kick her off because she was kicking and biting and you know, abusing every kid on the bus. A six-year-old little cute girl. Turned out she had a firestorm of toxic bugs in her gut and within oh, two weeks of an antibiotic and an antifungal, she completely transformed. She had some of the worst levels of these metabolites that are toxic metabolites they had seen in anybody. I saw another woman with severe OCD who couldn't even clean or pick up her, anything in her house for six years. She had high levels of ammonia from toxic bacteria. We cleaned out her bugs in her gut and she was able to clean out her house. So it may be a lot of reasons why you have OCD or these problems, but you can identify these triggers. Uh, it could be toxins, like a toxic injury, heavy metals, petrochemicals, environmental mold toxins. Mitochondria, I was talking to um, Fred last night and he kind of stared blankly at me <laughs> about what are mitochondria. They're these little energy factories that, that are, are, are in your brain and your heart more than any other organs that if you lose energy, you lose function. Just like anything. And there's a lot of things that cause a loss of energy, including toxins, infections, microbes, allergens, nutrient problems, and any acute or chronic stress. These things all will affect our brain. So let's just go down into a story of a little boy and so you can see what I'm talking about in a practical way. It's really a holographic model for thinking about disease. And if you use these basic parameters that I just went through with you, you'll actually be able to map out what's really going on. Now, 12 million kids are held hostage by a psychiatric disorder. This was an ad that they actually, they didn't like this, uh, people pulled this ad, but it was a billboard for a while talking about how many kids are affected by this. And we see the rates of disease here like rheumatic fever and measles and TB going down and other diseases like asthma and MS and Crohn's disease going up. But when you look at the graph for autism, it's just off the chart in terms of what's happening from one in 10,000 to one in 50 in a, less than a generation. Something's happening here. So the question I have, is the cure for brain disorders outside your brain? Maybe the problem is, isn't our brain. Maybe it's everywhere else. And if we fix those problems, then we can get traction. So what's going on here? This is little Clayton, who was 12 years old when he came to see me, and he was a problem kid. He'd been on Ritalin for years, repeated kindergarten, you know. I mean, having to repeat kindergarten, that's pretty bad. He had behavior problems, poor school performance. He was always zoned out, disruptive, had trouble focusing. Sounded like me when I was a kid, right? Um, he was really horrible at handwriting, terrible handwriting, and he had all these other issues that the psychiatrists thought were separate, like asthma and hives and, and allergies, canker sores, eczema, postnasal drip, sore throats, he had bumps in the back of his arms, he had stomach aches, nausea, diarrhea, headaches, insomnia, muscle cramps. I mean, he had everything, right? Anxiety, carb cravings. And uh, he has this whole list of symptoms, and he was on a whole list of drugs, which is why I call myself a holistic doctor, because they take care of with a whole list of problems. And <laughs> his system was out of balance. That was really the issue. We needed to kind of not just use one drug to fix it, but a whole array of different things to get his body back in balance. They needed all sorts of issues, history of antibiotics, infections, had been on seven medications. I mean, why does a little kid need to be on seven medications, right, and see so many specialists? He had a specialist for every part of his body, and no one asked, how is everything connected? 
how are all these things linked up? Is it just a coincidence that he's got ADD and asthma and stomach aches and hives and, you know, these anxious and he can't sleep? No, these are all the same problem. So he wasn't just a kid who had bad luck and had all these issues that need to be treated separately. We are just asking the wrong questions. So we took his story and we mapped it out, all the symptoms in these basic systems, right? His gut, and his immune system, his ability to detoxify, his nutritional status, his hormones, and we could gather this from his story. Um, I'm afraid that your irritable bowel has progressed. You now have furious and vindictive bowel syndrome. Right? So his gut was a mess. And we see the body as this network, right? This network of these basic few systems. And these are the core systems that affect everything else. So whatever disease you have, this is where I spend my time thinking about what creates imbalance in these systems? What do I take out that's creating imbalance? And what do I put in that can help create balance? And I do that in each of these systems, and they're all interconnected, and miracles happen. So we treat the system, not the symptoms. So what were his systems that were out of balance? We had a lot of nutritional problems. He had low omega-3 fats because he never ate fish. He had high saturated trans fats because he ate processed food and bologna all the time. He had low minerals, zinc and magnesium, because his industrial food diet has no minerals in it. He had vitamin deficiencies, low beta carotene, which caused, was caused by never liking a vegetable. Vitamin D, because he was inside playing video games all day. And vitamin E, because he never had any whole grains. And he had B6 deficiency, because his gut was mess and he couldn't metabolize these nutrients. His immune system was off. He had food sensitivities. He had gluten antibodies. He had immune cell problems, where he had too many of the cells that fight yeast and not enough cells that fight bacteria. He had high lead levels. And he had all this disordered biochemistry that had to do with the vitamin metabolism that affects your brain. So these are just to sort of show you that how we understand the sort of interconnections between everything is really powerful. And we can play with this system by understanding what happens. Uh, and, and we did different kinds of tests in, in functional medicine. We look at food sensitivities. We look at genetics and SNPs. This is impaired detoxification. We look at heavy metals, heavy metals like mercury and lead. We look at gut function and, and immune function in the gut. We look at your poop. Uh, they call me Dr. C every poop because I, I like to look at what's going on in the gut. Um, we look at mitochondria, we look at how your metabolism is working. We're not looking for disease, we're looking for disturbances in function. So what do we do? It's very simple. Like I said before, we take out the bad stuff, we put in the good stuff. So we got rid of the processed food, we got rid of the foods that were causing inflammation, the allergies, the gluten, we killed the yeast with an antifungal drug. We got rid of the heavy metals, the lead in the system. Then we put in the good stuff, real food, very simple. I mean, I'm really embarrassed often that I make a living telling people to eat real food. It's like, uh, you know, someone came in to see me and said, Dr. Hyman, I'm really tired, and I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm just fatigued all the time. I said, well, how many hours a night do you sleep? Well, four to five hours. I said, well, sleep eight hours. That'll be $500, please. <laughs> <laughs> eat real food, sleep, you know, exercise. It's not that hard. Uh, he, he, we gave him the things he was deficient in, the nutrients. We put back healthy bacteria in his gut. Um, and in two months, all of his symptoms were gone. After being sick his whole life, he was off all his medications. He had no behavior concentration problems. He was sleeping and succeeding for the first time socially and academically in school. He's now going to, uh, I think, Caltech or something like that. He just got into college. But what was really striking to me wasn't that all his tests went back to normal when we tuned everything up. We gave him a biological tune-up. We didn't treat his disease. We just got things normal. It was this. When he came to see me, this was his handwriting. You couldn't read. He's 12 years old. Or maybe some of your handwriting looks like this. <laughs> okay, but after two months, his mother brought his homework back and it looked like this. Now, I didn't treat his brain. I didn't give him handwriting classes. I didn't give him occupational therapy. I simply created coherence where there was incoherence in his brain by creating the conditions for health and removing the conditions that were impairing his health. It's really that simple. And the body knows what to do. So how do you create synchrony and coherence in your neural systems? How do you set the stage so you can remember everybody's name in this room? Because I promise you, if you've got toxic bacteria in your gut, or you're nutrient deficient, or you have no omega-3 fats, or you're eating something that's causing your brain to be inflamed, it's very hard to use any of the tools that you're going to learn here this week. You want to set the stage for having an optimal brain function, and then you can use it to really create a superhero. So there are a lot of things that are interacting here. There's, there's gene environment interactions, there's toxins and immune disturbances like microbes and allergic triggers, there's your gut function, there's your diet, nutrition and stress, all interacting with your genes and your biology. And then there's abnormal conditions that arise from that. There's abnormal cells that, that are, are, are manifested, cell structures altered, your membranes are made up of fat, 
their connect connections and interconnections between those affected are affected by what you're doing every day, by every bite of food you're taking. And then you get altered processing. Things don't connect. The dots don't connect. And then you see the symptoms. But just they're way downstream. This is upstream medicine, not downstream medicine, right? So uh, this was me. I figured this out because I was sick. I, this was me when I was 35. I'm 53 now. And you know I look a lot better now than I did then. And I had developed mercury poisoning and had a gut problem that I got from something in Maine that I didn't know was in some lake. And all of a sudden, my system shut down. I went from riding my bike 100 miles a day to not being able to walk up the stairs, from being able to see 30 patients in a day, not take notes and dictate everybody's chart, to not knowing where I was at the end of a sentence from where I started, not being able to read my children a book out loud and understand the words at the same time. That's how bad it was. And so I had to undo all this. And it was through my own healing that I discovered this extraordinary model of healthcare. And I began to wonder, how do things really work? How does the universe connect it? How are all these things going on? And I realized we're in a paradigm shift. It's as big a paradigm shift as when um, Galileo said the Earth is not the center of the universe, or Columbus said the world is not flatter, when Darwin said that species don't just arise fixed as they are, but they evolve through natural selection. These are revolutionary ideas that completely shifted the paradigm. So what I'm saying here today is that the way we think about disease is completely wrong. It's completely flawed. And the more we try to find the Alzheimer's drug, the more we find the, try to find the diabetes drug, the more we're going to fail. And this model is called functional medicine. I'm the chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine. We train doctors all over the world in this model about how to actually use this practically in the clinic. And there are thousands of doctors all over. We just paid back in China. We teach in South Africa and England, all the United States. And it's a profound model that's a repeatable methodology. It's a system of thinking. It's not a tool or a test or a treatment. It's really a way of thinking about how to think systemically about issues. And we've documented what this model looks like. It's really treating the root problem, which is how your lifestyle influences your genes and creates triggers that then create disturbances in these basic systems. And then we don't pay much attention to the signs and symptoms and diseases out at the periphery. And we use this model as a map. We look at the predisposing factors, the lifestyle factors, and how they influence these basic systems and how those interact with your mental, emotional, and spiritual life. And this is, this is the model of functional medicine encapsulated. And we can share more about this later if you want, or I encourage you to sort of check out the Institute for Functional Medicine. But this is the methodology we use. So what I'm here to tell you is that whatever genes you got, they're not your destiny. Your genes are not fixed. Your genes can be modified by everything you do, by every thought you have, by every step you take, by every bite you eat. Every minute, every second, your genes are an expression of your choices. And you can reverse disease at any age in life. It's pretty remarkable. And the environment influences your genes. 95% of chronic disease is not genetic, it's how the environment interacts with our genes. And we see this with the Pima Indians who went from being thin and fit to being the second most obese population in the world. 80% have diabetes by the time they're 30. And we see the opposite is possible. You can take a bunch of aborigines who were obese and diabetic and hypertensive and take them from the city and put them out in the outback because they still remember how to hunt and gather. In seven weeks, all their diseases are gone. We have the capacity to do this. And it doesn't take years. It takes days or weeks. So it, we know the science of creating resilience, of how to create biological resilience. And it's actually by this new drug that we've discovered. And this drug has the power to improve the expression of tens of thousands of genes, can improve the balance of dozens of hormones, can optimize tens of thousands of biological networks. It works faster, better, and is cheaper than any drug ever discovered. It has no side effects, and it's available to almost everyone on the planet. It's food. Food is not like medicine. It is medicine. It's like code. It's biological sort of software programming that programs your expression every moment. And if you understand that, you're going to make different choices about what you put in your body. Because at every moment, you're understanding that food isn't just calories and energy, it's information, and it's talking to our genes and our epigenome. It's transforming your bi biological software with every moment, and you have a choice to upgrade or downgrade that through this entire science we call nutrigenomics or epigenetics. So let's talk more about how to fix your brain, because we all want to do that. And, and it's really this sort of methodology that I've, I've mapped out in a way that the average person can understand in the UltraMind solution. And if you heal the body, then you can power up your brain, right? And it creates personalized prescriptions that you can understand. There's quizzes, for example, that help you identify where your imbalances are. Are you omega-3 deficient? Are you insulin resistant? Do you have toxins? Are you allergic to something? Do you have inflammation? What is the cause of your brain dysfunction? Because it might be different 
than the cause of somebody else's, right? So let's talk about, for example, dementia. This is a scary topic. I mean, nobody wants to lose their memory. And it's one of the most frightening diseases. So I wrote an article called, Does Dementia Exist? Dispelling the Myth. Now, this is your brain. On the left is a normal brain. On the right is an Alzheimer's brain. It's atrophied, it's shrunken, and its function is diminished. And this was from Bloomberg News Today. Now, I can tell you that drug companies are spending billions of dollars trying to find the Alzheimer's drug, and none of them are working. None of them are working. And no one of them will work. Because it's not a drug deficiency, it's a problem that's more, more upstream, and they're treating the downstream symptoms. So th this study was fascinating. These researchers took patients, and they gave them who had pre-dementia, who were early on, and they did MRI imaging, and they monitored their brain size and their brain function. And they found that there was a dramatic reduction in brain atrophy simply by taking a few pennies worth of vitamins a day, B6, folate, and B12. There was a 53% reduction in brain atrophy and a 69% increased ability to remember things like words, right? I mean, I'm sure Jim would like that. <laughs> you could increase your memory by 69% just by taking a few vitamins. So this actually was a story of a patient of mine. It was 78 years old. She was a very successful woman on boards and so forth. She was a huge actor in the community and she had to pull back, but she started to get dementia. She got what we call MCI, which is pre-dementia, or mild cognitive impairment. She had depression, fatigue, memory issues. And on her lab test, we found she had very high levels of methylmalonic acid and homocysteine, things that your average doctor will never test. Okay, these are simple blood tests you can get in any lab. One detects your functional capacity to use B12, and the other is related to your status of folate or folic acid. So what did we do? We gave her B12 shots, because as you get older, you can't absorb B12 as well. And we gave her a high dose of a special activated folate to bypass a genetic kind of weak spot or a SNP that she had. And we gave her some basic support of a multi omega-3 and vitamin D. And when we followed up with her, all her labs were normal and all her symptoms were better. And three years later, she called me up. She says, Doctor, I don't want to, hi, why are you calling me? Because, you know, she kind of got better. She says, she says, well, I'm going to Bhutan. I want to know what to bring with me to go trekking over there. <laughs> and she was completely resolved. I had another man who was seven years old who came to me with dementia and had been completely disconnected from his uh, career as a CEO and running his family company and was at home and withdrawn and could not focus and remember and was, was really dis disruptive to his whole family because his personality was changing. And we did some testing. We found he had some genetic quirks. They're like, not mutations, but they're just variations. It's like, like a changing a musical note changes the theme. Or for example, England, they spelled the word color C-L-O-U-R. Here we spell it C-O-L-O-R. It's just a letter difference, but it changes things. So you have eight billion letters in your genetic code, and when you change any of those letters around, you get different things. You may not metabolize folate as well, you may not detox mercury as well, you may not do other things. So he had met various SNPs that were all collectively causing him to have a high risk for dementia. APOE, folate SNPs, glutathione SNPs, cholesterol SNPs, these are all things that we can identify and you do something about. This is how we use lifestyle nutrition to change your gene expression. So he had high cholesterol, he had insulin problems, he had blood sugar, and he had high homocysteine, right, the folate problem. And he had low glutathione, low detox, and his mercury was off the chart because he lived in Pittsburgh. And everybody from Pittsburgh has high mercury. If you're from Pittsburgh, get your mercury checked. Because uh, US Steel, they coal ashes everywhere. They put it on everything. And he had a 30-year history, history of gut issues. So we treated him. We got rid of his gut problems, got rid of the diet triggers, the food sensitivities, cleared up the bad bugs, got rid of the mercury. We cleared out the bacteria that were causing a problem. We gave him healthy bacteria. We got him on a low sugar diet. The sugar is a brain toxin. We got him on an allergy-free diet. We got rid of his fillings, got it chelated to get all the metals out. We gave him phytonutrients from plants to boost his detox capacity. We gave him good fats to help build his brain structure. We got him minerals to help him detoxify, like selenium and zinc. And we got him the B vitamins, B12, folate, and B6, special forms of these to help his brain work properly. And within a very short time, really, when we, maybe a year, we cleaned these things up, his brain recovered. And I've had patients I've sent back to the memory disorder unit at Harvard after a year of treatment, and their brain imaging is better. Their spec scans are better. Their blood flow is better. Their neuropsych testing is better. And I said to the neurologist there, who's one of the world leading neurologists in memory, I said, how does this happen? I mean, who am I to be doing this, right? I'm just a family doctor who's figured out a 
way to treat the root causes of the problem. But why, how can really, I mean, I was shocked. How could this really happen? He said, because the brain is incredibly resilient. And if you remove the insults to the brain and provide the basic ways for it to thrive, then recovery is possible, even fairly late. So the model is very simple, and it's common sense, right? The Mark Twain said, the problem with common sense, it's not too common. So, so really, it's eating right. It's what do you do to eat well? It's really eat real food, as Michael Pollan said, not too much, mostly plants. And it's tuning up, and he added one thing, and things that you cook yourself, right? Because if you cook it yourself, it's, you know, from real ingredients, probably OK. And then there's how do you tune up your brain chemistry with the right supplements, the vitamins, fish oil, so forth. And how do you create an ultra mind lifestyle, which is exercise, which increases miracle growth for the brain. It's been the one thing that's shown to prevent dementia. Sleep, incredibly important. People skimp on their sleep, but if you are sleep deprived and you're driving, it's the equivalent of being drunk. Or if you're doing mental performance exercise, it's equivalent of being drunk. And relaxing, finding ways to unhook and de-stress and go into profound relaxation. I'm not talking about sitting on the couch, drinking beer and watching a football. I'm talking about a profound, deep, physiologic relaxation. It comes from breathing or meditation or yoga. Um, and then training your brain, things that, that Jim teaches you about. How do you use your brain and actually do thought lifting? Or what do you call the smart bells, right? <laughs> uh, and living clean and green, getting rid of toxins in your environment. So how do you eat right for your brain? Well, you start with identifying things that are triggering inflammation because your brain is very sensitive to inflammation. So you want to get rid of the common triggers and see how they make you feel. Gluten and dairy can cause so many different neurologic problems. You want to stop the brain damage. Get rid of all the anti-nutrients and processed food. Eat real food, organic when you can, unprocessed food. Eat lots of fruits and vegetables, lots of fiber, good quality protein like nuts and seeds and beans and, and lean protein, fish, chicken. Uh, and foods containing omega-3 fats like wild fish or hemp seeds or chia seeds and good fats like coconut butter. Coconut butter is basically like rocket fuel, fuel, fuel for your brain and your mitochondria. And then you want the right supplements. A good multi, less calcium, more magnesium, with special B vitamins, folate B6, B12, vitamin D, and omega-3 fats. Very simple. You don't take a million things and most of these you can even get in combinations. And then there's personalization. So in these cases I talked about some of these different ways of optimizing your systems, right? And, and we optimize nutrition, we balance your hormones, we cool off inflammation, we fix your gut, we boost detox, we boost your energy metabolism, and we calm your mind. And, and there are, are methodologies for each of these for creating balance in them. And I, I, I showed you in these cases how we did it, and, and, and there's much more to it, but it's basically treating the fire, not the smoke. Um, how much time do I have? Five minutes, okay. So what I'm gonna do is jump through these cases which are basically showing how we treated depression through a very similar approach. And it's the same, same ideas of treating these basic systems and dealing with this problem of sugar issues and diabetes. By the way, if your stomach is big and you have an increased waist to hip ratio, you have a smaller brain. So the bigger your belly, the smaller your brain. So if you, if you wanna increase the size of your brain, shrink your belly by getting off of sugar. Don't drink your calories. Um, I want, to, I want to talk to you about a, a sort of another piece of this, which is not just the idea of, uh, not just the idea of, of treating these biological networks, but you know, what, what I can say to you very clearly is that we understand how to turn the dials on biology, how to optimize biological networks, how to improve your system so you can create optimal functioning. It's called functional medicine, and it's a powerful roadmap for everything from treating far advanced disease to taking someone who's well and making them even better. But there's another part of this, which is how do you change behavior? How do you take these personalized prescriptions and functional medicine, which is a disruptive technology that overthrows the tyranny of the diagnosis, how do you take this and how do you use this roadmap and do something different with it that changes behavior? Because if I only change biology and I don't change behavior, then I've only gone halfway. I can tell you all these things, you'll go, this sounds great, I'm gonna go home and do it tomorrow, but you probably won't, okay? <laughs> you might take a few vitamins, you might you know, try to eat more fish, which is all great. And by the way, you do want fish for brains. <laughs> you, you wanna ask a different question, which is how do you change behavior? And I had a very powerful insight that most chronic disease is not 
what normally, normally we call it, which is NCD, or non-communicable disease. It's actually communicable. It's a social disease. The things like heart disease and obesity, these are, and lifestyle-related disease, these are social diseases, and they need a social cure. And I had this insight after I went to Haiti. And I went with Paul Farmer, we're the first doctors on the ground there, and it was a horrific experience. We saw the most horrible tragedy. The military said it was worse than anything they'd ever seen in Afghanistan or, or Iraq. The trauma was unimaginable. The human suffering was unimaginable. And we, we dove into that and we fixed it and we did it. And then I got to know Paul Farmer and understood what he was really doing in Haiti before the earthquake. And he'd said, look, you have these populations who have TB and AIDS in the poorest places in Haiti. It's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, one of the poorest countries in the world. And everybody gave up on them, said, we can't, this is too big a problem, we can't fix this. It's like people say, oh, obesity, you know, diabetes, Alzheimer's, these are too big problems, we can't really solve these problems, they're too big. But he realized they were very small problems. They were local problems. They were problems of community. And that's why I love this downtown project so much, because it's all about restoring and revitalizing community and building connection. The idea of collision is just a brilliant idea that talks about the power of each other to transform our lives and create a collective better experience together. So Paul actually used community health workers to deliver medications and treatments to these patients. It wasn't a better invention of science. It wasn't better technology. It was simply people helping people. So I had this idea. This is an area in Haiti where I visited, where he had his clinic. And it was pretty rough. And, and I realized that chronic disease was a social disease and needed a social cure. And, and I realized we had to think differently. You know. It, when Henry Ford um, said, if, if, my, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, right? We don't need a faster horse. We need a totally different way of thinking about this. So this guy, Nigel Crisp, was the head of the National Health Service. And after I came back from Haiti, I read his book called Turning the World Upside Down, about how we need to put patients and communities at the center of health care, not doctors and hospitals. I mean, there's 8,760 hours in a year. How many of those do you spend in a health care system? A couple? What do you do in the other 8,750-something hours? Health doesn't happen in the healthcare system. Happen, health happens where we eat and where we live, where we cook and where we learn and where we work and where we play and where we pray. That's where health happens. So I had this insight, and I'm like, what am I going to do with this? I had this insight that maybe there was a different way of influencing our gene expression called sociogenomics. There's nutrigenomics, which is using food to influence gene expression, but what about the power of each other to affect our gene expression. We now know that our genetic threads are not as important as our social threads. That our social threads may be more important than our genetic threads in determining our health outcomes. That you're more likely to be overweight if your friend's friend friend is overweight than if you're overweight. So one day this guy walks in my office who is overweight named Rick Warren who's a pastor from Southern California. I'm a Jewish doctor from New York so I didn't really know much about you know, him or what he did. But after I treated him, he went out to dinner. I said, tell me what you do, Rick. He says, well, I got this church with 30,000 people. I'm like, wow. He says, yeah, we have 5,000 groups that meet every week. Small groups. And I'm like, wow, this isn't a mega church. This is thousands of mini churches. I said, why don't we take this model of community-based wellness and then put it in your system? He's like, yeah, let's do it. So we created a healthy living curriculum. We called the Daniel Plan after Daniel from the Bible that resisted the king's temptation of bad food. And we thought a few hundred people would show up. And the first week, the campus was overrun at the first rally. 15,000 people signed up for this program. It was incredible. And I realized that it was community where this happens. You know, if you look at where health happens, you know, there's two hospitals in Rwanda, or three hospitals, two days walk from the average Rwandan. There's, there's uh, maybe 14 health centers, which are one day's walk from the average Rwandan. There's 728 churches within five minutes of the average Rwandan. Where should they get their care? It's in the community where they live, right? So we created the Daniel Plan, and uh, actually we're coming out with a book in December about this. You've got a Jewish, a Christian, and Muslim. Sounds like a bad joke, and, and, a, and a pastor. We actually had cooking classes on stage. It was pretty funny. Uh, and this is, this is the, the church, and I, you know, I was lecturing on there with a big cross behind me, and someone took a picture and sent it to my mother. It was like really... <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is Rick before and after. He lost 60 pounds, and uh, we had after a year, they lost a quarter of a million pounds the church together. It was reported in Time Magazine, CNN, and people had you know, these placards they put up which showed, well, which is amazing, they showed that they had these transformations, not only just 
weight loss, which it wasn't a weight loss program, but their depression went away, and their diabetes went away, and their autoimmune diseases, and their asthma, and their reflux, and their acne, and their depression, and their, their sleep problems, and everything got better because we created health, and diseases went away as a side effect. Here's uh, Pastor Steve, who was born again again. He lost, in the first six weeks, he lost 35 pounds, his, lost four inches off his waist, his triglycerides dropped over 300 points, his cholesterol went up down 50, his blood sugar went to normal, his good cholesterol went up, and he was off his medications. And this is him, a few weeks ago, he came to my house to visit, he lost 90 pounds, he's completely healthy, he's totally changed his life. They used to have, he was holding up ribs for breakfast. They would do Bible study in the morning, have ribs for breakfast. This is Chiquita, who was very overweight and sick, and she lost 155 pounds simply through the power of support. She gave me a, a shirt called My Body is My Temple, which is really about uh, the power of community. And the people who did the program together, because we tracked the research on this, they lost twice as much weight as those who did it alone and got twice as healthy. The same program. So we have to rethink health. We have to rethink medicine. We have to take back our health together in a community. Um, Paul Farmer had this plaque at his center up in Haiti in the far village, and in French it means, the happiest man is the one who makes others happy. An African proverb is beautiful, I love this, it says, if you want to travel swiftly, go alone. But if you want to travel far, travel together. So I hope together we can transform our own health, our collective health, and the health of our global community. So thank you very much.